my mother used to give me candies and chocolate and comics to read so i used to read a lot of chacha chaudhary comics you know <laughs> <laughs> those are like some of the early memories according to buddhist beliefs we have uh, taken so many rebirths we have accumulated so many good karma as well as bad karma and it's only as a human being mm. that we have the capacity to cleanse them mm. it's the our only opportunity now that's why we use the term precious human body the process of transformation also requires you to surrender and surrender is like letting go of control that is something that people of my generation struggle with how do we make ourselves come to the acceptance of surrender i like working out i like weight lifting and i do a lot of uh, hit people who harm me the most um people who are angry at you who you know who are unpleasant to you you have actually initiated the cycle in your past life anger can be destructive if expressed but anger can also be channeled with the correct understanding to burn your bad karma in my opinion spirituality doesn't have to be religious doesn't have to be ritualistic uh in my opinion spirituality is about humanity it's about love and compassion very simple Hi and welcome to the Journey Within podcast with me Shobha Rana. This is a podcast where we encourage conversations to understand the concept of our inner world, to take that journey within, and we do that through the inspiring stories of our guests who have navigated through of course a lot of highs and lows in their own lives and have uh, interesting insights to share with us. Today with me on this podcast we have a Buddhist monk. I met him about a couple of years ago and since then I have been very influenced by his story his personal story and also his teachings please welcome Palga Rinpoche ji thank you thank you Shubha hello rinpoche ji uh, i am so happy to have you on the podcast thank you for agreeing to do this on such a short notice you're welcome and i have been so influenced by your personal story also and that is what i want to start with uh, the story of you becoming a monk uh, when did this whole inner turbulence start to impact you and when did you start choosing the uh, path of becoming a monk so i am from ladakh and um, i belong to what we call vajrayana buddhism or you can call it himalayan buddhism some people call it tibetan buddhism but i think it's a buddhist kind of buddhism that is practiced all along the himalayas uh at the age of 1 my guruji gelong drupa the 12 gelong drupa the head of our lineage he recognized me as uh, the eighth reincarnation of the previous palgarin poche who was from tibet mm-hmm. and who was actually i think uh, brutally murdered by the chinese forces in 1959 mm-hmm. uh, some of the trauma that i still carried and remembered you know when i was mm-hmm. young and only when i was 8 uh, my mother agreed to uh, let me go to the monastery and to be properly enthroned and recognized in a formal way so so yeah i mean my journey as a as a buddhist uh, whether you're a monk or not rinpoche or not as a buddhist uh, actually wasn't my choice it was kind of chosen for me mm. so that's how it all began an 8 year old child doesn't understand much and uh, when your mother took you to the monastery and you were throned as the a3 incarnation of uh, palga rinpoche ji uh, guru ji uh, then how did life shape up after that Uh, did you go to the regular schools or did you study in the monasteries um so up until i was 8 i had done some very basic education i think i went to like until third grade maybe two and a half grades <laughs> <laughs> i i remember the stories of kachu where are my glasses ramalinga who was a brahmin very clever i remember the story of the hare and the tortoise um mm. you know I didn't like maths that much. Um so yeah, I did some very basic education in school like I just knew the basic alphabets and everything. Um then uh when I went to the monastery which was in Himachal actually uh in a place called Jivalsar uh district Mandi about 5 6 hours from Dharamsala. <clears throat> There I uh, studied uh the basics of Buddhism, the Tibetan, you know, Bodhi grammar. a uh, reading writing and then afterwards i went to a university where i studied with this philosophy for about 5 6 years 
um, and then yeah, and then I traveled to Europe and so on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, talk me through your journey of adolescence, uh, teenage years. Uh, what were you practicing then? Uh, where were you? Which part of the world? And how was life? Um, life. My life has been quite turbulent. Uh, very soon, very fast, very intense, very early. That's, I think, how you can put them in like three, four sentences. <clears throat> um, so I, when I was young, I used to remember that I was not from this place. I was not from Ladakh. I used to tell my mother that you are not my parents. Just imagine how These traumatic. were dreams? Or yeah, not? these were like, uh, I had visions of falling down, of getting stabbed with a bayonet or getting shot. So I had these like very uh, graphic uh, images in my head. I couldn't shake them off, Um, even though my mother used to give me candies and chocolate and comics to read. So I used to read a lot of Chacha Chaudhary comics. (laughs) Those are like some of the early memories. Um, Yeah, so then I used to remember my past life. Um, Now I've forgotten most of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just a few images remain. So I used to tell my mother, like my parents, my father and my mother, I'm not from here. I'm from someplace else. You're not my family. And then uh, my mother would say, what nonsense, you know, just do your homework and eat properly and so on. So I was very happy when I was eight years old. And in 1992, uh, Gelong Rukpa, my Guruji, he recognized me formally uh, for the second time and enthroned me uh, in at Himis Monastery, which is, uh, I think, one of the most important monasteries in Ladakh. Ladakh and yes. then, um, and yeah, I was so elated to mm-hmm. sit on the throne. I felt like I, I actually was wearing my real skin. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a bit like that, you know, the, the school clothes, the life before that, up until eight years old, really didn't feel like my life. Buddhism as a concept uh, in India has also taken off uh, really rapidly in the last, let's say, a couple of decades or last decade particularly. Yes. Because uh, uh, Gautama Buddha is, uh, you know, we read about him in books and all of that. But the practical application of those studies, uh, that is becoming now a little more of curiosity uh, for people like me, yes, for yes. our generation. So what is the relevance of Buddhism for our generation today, where does it fit into the practical lives that we lead, which are full of, uh, you know, us looking outwardly in a world to have our ambitions, our desires and everything that we are working so hard for. And then it is teaching you the concepts which are constantly reeling you back in. So how does one find a balance and a practical application for Buddhism? See, just listening to a question um, makes me realize that you know quite a bit about Buddhism, actually. Uh, there was a very profound question, and I don't know if I can justify this with the next two minutes of my answer, but, but let me try. Uh, Buddhism is very vast. Uh, in terms of like a Bible for Buddhism, we have more than 100 of them. Mm. So it's almost impossible to read them all. Mm. You know, forget about understanding their meaning and mm. to practice them. One lifetime is not enough. So maybe that's why I'm born for the, <laughs> born eight. For the eight time. Yeah, but I think I haven't even finished eight volumes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have if like, you're saying so, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Where are we heading? Um, so yeah, in today's world, the way I see Buddhism is Buddhism is not a religion. It's not um, a set of uh, rules that you must follow. That was also one of my questions that is Buddhism a religion or a philosophy because there's a little confusion yeah. and overlap there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I approach it as a philosophy. Yes, yes, That's yes. why it becomes more digestible yes, for me. Yes. But when I was doing my master's in yoga, uh, which was my second master's degree, I did it a couple of years ago. There I studied the subject of Buddhism a little bit in depth mm. and there they were calling it a religion. So I just got curious. I think for the sake of conversation, is, people, because it looks like a religion because mm-hmm. we do have a structure in place. We do have hierarchies. We do have systematic ways of, of practicing and we do have different paths and different lineages mm. so it may look like a like a religion and we as humans we always like to label things mm. table sofa you know mm. like you can't call this a chair mm. you have to call it something so we call it a sofa mm. uh, so you know like buddhism you can't just call it a philosophical way of life it just doesn't roll up the tongue that easily mm. so just for the sake of faith mm. and do you know when you make laws and you know what I mean like when you put right. a system in place because right. we live in a system in a right. civilized system right. so just to fit into that system I think Buddhism has been given the label of religion but if you observe it closely we don't believe in a god that creates and destroys mm. we don't believe in a, you know somebody who punishes us somebody who rewards us um, Buddhism I would say it's more like a, a philosophical way of life 
yeah philosophical a set of principles mm. uh and some of those principles uh would be compassion loving kindness patience uh meditation and you know but yeah, so buddhism is i think in my opinion it's like water for me religion is like ice mm. that, that's the way i see it i'm not judging i'm not you know comparing but that's the way i see it mm. so buddhism can be practiced by muslims by hindus by sikhs by jains by christians mm. by all faiths like uh, matter of fact i know some muslim friends uh some lovely people and they are more buddhist than some of my actual so called buddhist friends likewise i have some hindu friends mm. and they are more buddhist they they follow the principles of buddhism without knowing about it mm. just by being good human being and focusing on humanity mm. and using love and compassion as their you know foundation yeah so buddhism mm. is very uh open mm. and, the application of buddhism into today's life uh, mm. that we are leading yes. uh, where does it fit in and how does it teach us to be be better and to yeah so like water it can fit any vessel so the buddhist teachings uh can not only be practiced by people of different faiths but also by different generations so like you mentioned the younger generation these days very outward focused uh looking for gratification and happiness in an external world and becoming a little bit materialistic i may say uh so understanding about buddhist philosophy uh studying it contemplating it and applying it becomes applicable to everyone um so for example let's just i'll give an example let's say um okay i'll just use you as an example let's say you find your happiness in shopping okay and parties and so on and you love doing you know going out and everything which is okay but then if you get caught up only by the appearance of phenomena and you don't know how phenomena actually is mm. you understand then uh, it starts to cause you suffering but if mm. you understand the buddhist philosophy you realize that you should not get caught up only with the appearance but you, you should understand how phenomena actually works how mm. phenomena actually is it's like watching a movie mm. when a child watches a movie he says papa the doggy died but the papa knows that the doggy hasn't died mm. like don't worry it's a movie the doggy hasn't died it's a movie mm. but the child only knows the appearance mm. not the behind the scene so from a buddhist perspective we teach the behind the scenes also so we don't get caught up only with the shopping bags and the parties mm. you understand we mm. understand the nature of those phenomena mm. that they're all impermanent mm. that we should not make them uh, the source of our happiness mm. because we are only limiting our ourselves mm. just as a party is impermanent it starts it stays and then it ends it has three modes birth remaining and end you are also making your happiness you know very compounded mm. very impermanent very short and then it's going to be short lived into yeah, yeah. those three uh, modes modes only birth remaining and end that's mm. it and then you keep recreating it you mm. have to keep shopping it right 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 like how many sales have you personally you know for sure, of, of course 100% i and you I, feel like if you get if you manage to attend this sale and manage to buy this bag this exclusive bag if mm. somebody gives it to you or you manage to buy it mm. you save for it you think like okay i think i'll be done but you know very well but the next day the next sale comes up and then you're like again yeah. i need that birth for, remaining and and, and yeah. again so you buy it you keep it and then you like oh there's a new edition True. ah this is a special limited edition mm. tag yeah True. okay so this is good but maybe if i get the limited edition only 1000 yeah. were made if i'm one of the lucky ones then you'll be like oh, after that again a new version comes so to understanding the impermanence of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. these material things is very important i completely believe um, in that and i try to live my life by that that you know enjoying everything while still being in the awareness of the impermanence of yes. those things and not yes. attaching uh, your happiness exactly. or worth to it exactly now uh, use the word attachment and um i think the kind of buddhism that we practice uh we don't um, necessarily reject uh, things we see things for how they are and we believe that if you have a lot of money if you have a good phone good car uh if you have lots of clothes uh it's okay it's nothing wrong with that the problem is the attachment to those to, to those things if a beggar is not attached to anything he has more wealth 
then a billionaire was attached to his mm. billion. So at the end, what brings us unhappiness is attachment. Attachment, I think, is uh, associated with a lot of suffering yes. that comes along. Yes. So uh, this is one of the lessons that I have learned the hard way in my life is to let go. Because the opposite of attachment is letting go. Yes. And letting go is something which does not come naturally to us. Yeah. This is something we have to teach ourselves. Attachment is something which comes naturally because you're born out of a womb. You know attachment. Yes. As a child who doesn't know anything else in the world, you still know attachment. You still know whose touch, who makes yes. you feel a certain way, who makes you feel comfortable, protected and all of that, who's nurturing you. You're attached to the things that you possess. You go to school and you have friends, you're attached to your friends, you're attached to the games that yes. you play. Yes. So attachment is something which is an integral part of our upbringing and conditioning and the way the world operates. Yes. But to break out of this attachment is something that we have to go through a personal training program. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Buddhism is one such great philosophy and some really, really amazing learnings there about detaching yourselves, letting go, kindness, compassion, loving. So I would uh, want you to throw some light on uh, the difference between the mind and the brain. Okay. Because a lot of these concepts emerge out of I guess the mind mm -hmm. or the brain, I would want you to explain more on this. I'm not an expert on the brain, but um, I think brain uh, is a very important organ in our body. Um, I don't know whether you can limit your mind to the brain. I think what we call the mind or the consciousness or the soul, that thing that thinks, the thing that thinks and knows that awareness it has many different names and even in Buddhism, it has many different names and um, many different layers. You cannot really say that uh, the brain contains the mind and the mind is limited to the brain. The mind is much more than that. Mm -hmm. The mind, for example, I know for a fact that when you practice uh, meditation, when you go deep within yourself, when you... Uh, start to expand your mind. Mind is like a balloon to me. Mm. And once you start to expand it, you start to be aware of things. You start getting aware of things, not only th that in your vicinity, but also beyond that. So my mm. Guruji tells stories like, um, like when he was meditating in his room mm. and he would know uh, which person is coming from that valley. Mm. So your mind kind of expands, mm. you know, like your brain is still the same. Mm. Your head hasn't become large. Mm. So, yeah, I think you cannot necessarily say that the brain is the mind or the mind is the brain. Mm. I think the mind is much more than the brain. Mm. And maybe it's like fire and heat, actually. Mm. I guess the brain is the organ of intellect in our body. Could be, yeah. That makes the nervous system work, that mm -hmm. makes the... Um, maybe like a circuit board. Yeah. Yeah, sort of yeah. like a circuit board. But the electricity is everywhere correct correct <laughs> a mind uh, does have all of the functioning of the brain i guess mm -hmm. the intellect but, but it also has additional components that yeah. uh, elevate our experience as as a human being in uh, i'm a student of yoga so uh, in that discipline they teach us that your mind has uh, intellect mm -hmm. uh, but it also has the ego it also has that I component and associates mm -hmm. everything uh, with yourself mm -hmm. and that is where a lot of raga uh, sorrow and uh, you know uh, misery comes in from so uh, uh, is there any such uh, bifurcation of mind in buddhism also in buddhism honestly we don't um, do it in a very scientific way mm. to be honest with you our gurus give us a set of instructions mm. they will say like because our gurus have um, developed their mind for many decades for many lifetimes mm -hmm. and they are completely enlightened and they know how to guide us so they don't burden you with uh, the complete set of instructions mm. uh, that may confuse you mm. that may make you more egoistic mm. that may make you crave for more that may make you what we call spiritually materialistic mm. i want to learn that also that's mm. very cool this is not very cool so mm. our gurus whether we agree to or not they guide us on a path and they give us a set of instructions mm. and then we practice it. We basically surrender ourselves to the Guru, mm. our spiritual self. We mm. surrender to the Guru that you know what's best for me spiritually. Mm. So just guide me. I want to talk about mindfulness with you. Uh, how is mindfulness 
different than the other forms of meditation? Oh, uh, to be absolutely honest with you, brutally honest with you, uh, mindfulness is a part of uh, the set of meditations that we practice. It is part of our curriculum, mm. but it's not the curriculum. And um, maybe because in the modern times, certain meditation techniques have been very effective for certain influential people. Mm. So it is really taken off. Mm. Uh, if you go to any monastery and you ask any monk who has meditated for years and years, uh, please, oh, mindfulness is so great. You know, please teach me. He would be like, really? Mm. But that's, you know, we've been doing it since That's child. the way of life. Yeah. Us. So it's for us, it's uh, honestly... For people who have like well, like me, who are, I've spent years in meditation, I spent more than three, five years, I think, in mm. a solitary retreat in a small room. Mm. Uh, never once did my teacher say like, okay, this is mindfulness. Mm. Yeah. That from tomorrow onwards, for the next mm. six months, you stop chanting, you stop visualizing, you stop doing this breathing practice. Now you do what we call mindfulness. Mindfulness is always there. So let me give an example. Um, when we chant, when we chant, our mind is focused. Our mind is focused. Our mind is aware. Our mind is mindful of the chant. We mm. focus on the chant. Mm. We see the chant. We are with the chant. Mm. Because the chant that is happening, mm. is happening now. It's mm. not happening in the past. It hasn't yet happened. It's in the present moment. Mm. So one very important thing that I can share with you uh, in a nutshell is that being mindful keeps you in the here and the now. Mm. It keeps you in the present moment mm. because the past doesn't exist. The future, it doesn't exist. Mm. The present fleeting moment mm. is the only one, the momentary moment that is still passing as mm. you move your legs, as you shift, you know, mm. as you breathe, it's passing. So it's to be in that moment. That is the only real moment that exists. Mm. But when you believe in the concept of karma and cause and effect, uh, then you kind of think about and plan about what you should be doing and how you should be conducting yourself because you don't want to earn bad karma. Yes. So how does one still stay mindful and yet believe in all these other concepts? Well, I think, I think you answered your question a little bit there because you're mindful that um, if you harm someone, which is what we call bad karma, um, you will suffer. And if you benefit someone or something, you will be happy. Mm. You, you're, you're mindful of that fact. Mm. So mm. we do everything mindfully. Mm. The way we talk to people, whether we agree or disagree, mm. we always try to smile, mm. uh, always try to be polite and um, try to be helpful to everybody without mm. judging them, without seeing the size of their wallets or how beautiful they are or whether they will be good for my career or not mm. so good for my career to see how many followers they have and basing your things. You know what I mean? Mm. So I think just to be mindful that um, committing good deeds brings us happiness and committing bad deeds brings us suffering. That is what karma is all about. Mm. And according to Buddhist beliefs, we have uh, taken so many rebirths. We have accumulated so many good karma as well as bad karma. And it's only as a human being mm. that we have the capacity to cleanse them. Mm. It's the, our only opportunity now. That's why we use the term precious human body. Mm. So it's very important to take care of yourself. How does one cleanse their karma of the past? Um, multiple ways. Usually the best way is to do good things, uh, is to help people, help animals, you know, be kind to the environment and so on. But one ultimate uh, teaching that all the teachings, uh, all the teachers encourage us to do is what we call bodhicitta. Bodhi means enlightened mm. and chitta means mind. mind. So the, the mind, enlightening mind or the wish to enlighten, you can rephrase it in many different ways. Basically, the ultimate karma, karma cleansing technique mm. is that whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever you think, you know, you have to think that whatever I do from now onwards, uh, may it contribute towards the enlightening of all sentient beings. Mm. Because if you feed someone, uh, you feed someone for two, three hours. After that person is again hungry. You give some clothes, it goes out of fashion. They may lose it. It may get torn. Uh, like if you give it a thick coat, it's good for the winter, mm. but not good for the summer. Mm. You understand? So it's temporary. But when 
a sentient being, when a human, an animal becomes enlightened, they are free from samsara. So they, you cut it at the root. Mm. You're not only chopping the branches. Mm. Yeah, like feeding someone, which is good, like mm. helping somebody financially or giving food and so on, which mm. is good. Mm. But it's like trimming the branches. But is it possible to be fully enlightened? In the lives that we are leading today. Yeah, yeah, very much. So for that, you have to uh, study the biographies of Milarepa, the the yogi from Tibet who mm. achieved enlightenment in one lifetime. Also, some of his predecessors like uh, Naropa, same thing. And the path that we practice, um, the lineage that we follow, we call it the Kagyupa lineage. It is based on meditation and oral instruction by the mm. teacher, you know. Um it is aimed towards achieving enlightenment in one lifetime. You're speaking about transformation, Guruji. Uh, the transformation is something that we all want. You know, it's, it's, it's a desire for everyone because the kind of lives that we are leading, uh, they're in some way not wor working for us, right? So transformation is something that we all want in our life. But the process of transformation, the things that you have to go through to be a transformed person, the path is not very easy. Mm -hmm. So how does one make that path easier and more acceptable? Basically um, make friends with the process. Yeah, um, I think the most important part is to meet a guru that you like, that you respect, that you connect with. Um, because not all the gurus are meant for everybody. Like some of the gurus that I personally feel very inspired from, some people criticize them because it's or they just don't understand them. Either they're too crazy, their teachings are too simple, or they only give you candies, they never teach you anything. You understand? So <laughs> um, it's about finding the right guru, the right guide, and then surrendering yourself spiritually to the guru. And then the transformation happens after that. The process of transformation also requires you to surrender. And surrender is like letting go of control. That is something that people of my generation struggle with. How do we make ourselves come to the acceptance of surrender? Surrendering doesn't mean you give up your car, you give up your parties, you give up your beautiful clothes, or you have to shave your head and mm. become, you know, a nun or a monk. It's not about that. Surrendering is uh, having the faith in your guru that whatever the guru teaches me, uh, advises me, spiritually mm. it's for my own spiritual benefit so you always listen to the guru spiritually not faith has got a lot to do with uh, the process of transformation also mm. because uh, throughout this path of transformation or even surrendering there will come times when you will doubt your choices when you will feel that what is the point of surrendering mm. to somebody or to a situation or what is the point of uh, letting go at that time to make peace with it and yet trust the process, keep faith. Uh, I think faith is one of the important components that keeps you going in, in, in those times. You know, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine and mm. she was talking about this uh, guru that she has now found and she's uh, following this uh, Qigong. 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 Qigong, I think. Oh, Qigong. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, Qigong. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like Tai Chi, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like Tai Chi. It, yes. yeah, yeah, I also Qigong, don't know much. Qigong, she's yeah. learning Qigong uh, these days from a guru. Okay. And uh, the way she was describing the transformation that she's experiencing. And then I started researching a little bit about it. I don't, very simple bodily movements. Yeah. You're flowing and, you know, it's, it's some, some bit of yoga involved in, and all of that. And the way she was this, uh, describing her guru and the kind of transformation that she feels through that practice. I mean, one can't have all kinds of logic questioning it mm -hmm. that something that you have been doing for so many years we all are used to movement and uh, she was also a student of yoga but this practice is something that she connects so much with practice, this right? particular practice yeah. which when I look, looked at what this is really about I found some of the basic movements it's like this is like yoga and so much more basic than it but it's all about that connection with the right guru and the right uh, form of expression or, or the guidance like that work, works for you. The genres of music. You may like rock, mm. but you may not like reggae. Mm. You may like heavy metal. Uh, you may not like hip hop. Mm. You may like rap, but you may not like R&B. Mm. So on. You may like jazz, but you may not like classical too much. You know your music too well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the kind of music that you're most into? <laughs> uh, when I'm, when I, I, I like working out. I like weightlifting and I do a lot of uh, HIIT. Uh, recently, I've been so busy, like two months, I've not been able to even see a you know, dumbbell, let mm -hmm. alone lift it. But usually when I work out, I listen to almost everything, actually. I listen to hip hop, yeah. I listen to rap, um, 
yeah mostly hip hop and rap guruji understand why it is difficult for people to believe in their one true nature which is of love and compassion and kindness especially if you have done something bad a bad karma and you are full of guilt how do you tell yourself that you are a good person your true nature is of love and kindness i think uh, as i mentioned earlier it is like a glass that has been stained uh, we know that the glass uh, when it comes out of the factory when it's mm-hmm. manufactured is pure it's clean the stain only comes afterwards is temporary so you need to understand and realize that whatever bad act you may have committed is temporary mm-hmm. the true nature is that of cleanliness purity and goodness and mm-hmm. just as the karma was accumulated mm-hmm. it can also be erased and cleansed mm-hmm. guru ji how do we practice compassion for the people who we don't like or <laughs> who sort of harm us or uh, Yeah, who generally I, don't give us the good vibes okay in buddhism when we do prostrations i think you've seen prostrations right yes you basically fold our palms together mm. put on our head body speech and mind, mind and you bend down um we are prostrating to the buddhas uh with our body speech and mind to accumulate good karma it's a practice when you do that very interestingly the way to visualize it on the right you have to visualize your father and the left your mother your parents very you know grateful to us and behind you and surrounding you all sentient beings mm. yeah uh, because buddhism is based on altruism because all sentient beings want to be happy and we want to deliver them to enlightenment together with us mm. in front of you facing the buddhas is your enemy you know so when i first first introduced to this concept i was like how is that possible how can i visualize how can i prioritize my enemies how can i put them in front of my parents mm. and in front of all sentient beings mm. yeah and then afterwards i discovered that people who harm me the most um people who are angry at you who you know who are unpleasant to you you have actually initiated the cycle in your past life you have to see it that way there are many different tricks and philosophies to explain that one very very good explanation is that it was your fault that you harmed that person in your past life <laughs> that in this life now this person is accumulating bad karma and is because of you mm. now how dare you respond back and harm him or her back you should rather keep quiet and this person needs god more buddha more so put him in the front yeah mm. it's your responsibility to, to cleanse this karma you need that much compassion your wow. compassion has your to be compassion boundless your compassion has to be bigger bigger boundless that you have to include you have to put your enemy in front of you mm. it's in front of your parents in front of the people that you care about yeah. before then you have to care about yeah, the person your, who is your, your enemy yeah if you can forgive your enemy if you can put him there you can put anybody else i think that is the ultimate <laughs> act of compassion that is it the ultimate is, test of compassion trust me it is the ultimate difficult <laughs> thing to do also. have you uh, done it practically have yeah, you yeah, yeah. Uh, i i've done it and honestly i've managed to forgive uh, some people uh, who have been very harmful to my parents and to you know so yeah especially if people harm you i really don't mind that much it's okay but if somebody harms our parents especially my mother guru ji what are the three easiest ways in which we can practice compassion oh that's a difficult thing to answer compassion is not feeling like oh i'm so sorry you know oh mera bachcha this and that it's not the feeling of mercy you superior that inferior you know um let me help you ye le lo jao you know it's not about that compassion is ultimately the buddhist practice of compassion is to understand that um the person is actually suffering it's a much deeper uh connection that you create with this person or this animal mm. beyond just feeling mercy mm. you have to actually understand the causes of uh, the person's or animal suffering mm. and you have empathy to, yeah mm. you have to understand that the root the cause of it and you have to understand that the suffering is happening mm. and you have to look for the solution and then you have to deliver the solution so mm. the four noble truths comes automatically mm. yeah so that's the way i look at it that's mm. the way my teachers have encouraged me to look at beyond just saying oh i'm so sorry i feel so sad this happened to you mm. you actually have to use your wisdom to understand why the person is going through suffering um another way to um practice compassion is to understand that in the same way you don't want to suffer others also don't want to suffer yeah uh that you want to be happy others also want to be happy so compassion is geared more towards understanding the suffering side and loving kindness chamspa maitreya 
it's geared more towards the wish to uh, make others happy. Mm. One is geared towards suffering, the wish to read, uh, rid people and animals of suffering. Mm. And Maitreya, uh, loving kindness, is geared more towards, focus more towards the wish to give people and others happiness. Mm. Yeah, because I don't want to suffer, I want to be happy. You don't want to suffer, you want to be happy. Mm. And likewise, everybody else in this mm. city. So I have to understand both your suffering and also what can I give to make you happy. Yes, yes. Mm. So once you know that, then you know that you should not shout back. You should not look badly, you know, with a frown to somebody else. Mm. You should always maintain calmness because nobody Mm. likes to be frowned upon. Mm. You don't like, I also don't like. Mm. Yeah. Nobody likes to be shouted and nobody likes to be stereotyped Mm. and used harsh words, this and that. Mm. I think in our Hindi vocabulary we have enough harsh words mm. to break somebody's heart True. unnecessarily you know especially mm. from the north <laughs> it's quite heavy yes you're right yeah, mm. and the way he express certain things even a simple word we say it with so much anger so much frustration and mm. it's not our anger based on what that person did to us it's about our frustration that is built up because of our lack of empathy Mm. so many frustration from our money from our relationships from parents and we use channel everything and then we focus it on one simple innocent person who's merely just cut your road with his mm. bike or delivered your food maybe five minutes late mm. like how dare you do it this and that you know you have to understand that he rode on his bike in heavy rain to deliver your soggy food so he goes late for five minutes because the police stopped him mm. you understand so you have to understand the whole process very well said, Guruji. Uh, Guruji, if I want to cause transformation for myself and if I want to include spirituality into my conduct in my life, what is the way that I can do that? Um, running around in a city you know, without, um, you know, um, without a teacher nearby uh, and not um, creating a momentum, it's slightly more difficult. I mean, there's only so much you can learn, from, read from books uh, and YouTube videos. They are a very good source of information. Mm. But in Buddhism, more than information, we are looking at wisdom. Mm. Yeah. So wisdom actually has to be uh, transferred, mm. has to be uh, given. Mm. Not it, it cannot be taught directly. So the best method would be to be in the company of a guru, in touch with the guru, and to, to follow the guru, whatever the guru prescribes you to, <clears throat> whichever religion or faith you follow. But if you can't do that, then just being a busy person, you know, uh, jumping from day to day life, mm. I suggest you chant mantras, mm. especially the mantra of Aulokitesh, Om Mani Padme Hum. Mm-hmm. It is very transformative. Um, never um, think that, you know, like the mantra, never doubt the mantra. Mm. Yeah, it is one mantra that uh, even the His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, my own Guruji, Gerong Rupa, Everybody like they they will bet their lives on. Mm-hmm. It is the ultimate mantra. The the essence of Buddhism is in this mantra. Mm-hmm. The essence of enlightenment is 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 in this mantra. This mantra is so powerful and so popular mm-hmm. that we print it on prayer flags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can see this behind cars now. Behind it's the cars, very popular. Behind, at homes. Yeah, so even people without realizing it, mm-hmm. they're getting blessed by the mantra. Such is the power of this mantra. Mm-hmm. We carve it on stones. But what happens by? Uh, repeating the mantra, how does it help it, you to combat anger? Honestly, I think the way I, I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, I think there's no scientific way to measure it or to analyze it. The way I feel is that right now our minds are like dry wood. Okay, dry wood. Uh, weak and easy to catch fire. Easy to break and easy to catch fire. Mm. Very brittle. Well, when you chant mantras, uh, mantras have this transformative power. Uh, Avalokiteshvara's mantra is the mantra of compassion. Actually, it is the complete mantra. And when you chant it, it's like putting uh, water or, or soaking a stick in water. It becomes wet. Mm. Neither it catches fire, nor can you break it. Mm. It's like a wet stick. It's strong. Mm. So it's a bit like that. So basically, it's not in the explanation. It's in the experience is what you're saying. Yes, like uh, the heat mm. of a fire, for example. Om mm. Mani Padmi you can write it. Mm. Yeah, in fact... At the end, I have a small gift for you, which has the Om Mani Padmi blessings. Yeah, thank you but, so much, Guruji. So it's like writing is simple. I can you can write in English, you can write in Bhoti, Sanskrit, but then it's the it's like fire. Writing is like fire, but the blessings of the mantra is like the heat. Mm. You don't see it, but you feel mm. the heat. Mm. Yeah, 
So if I give you the transmission, it is an oral transmission. You can you know Om Mani Padme Hum. It is six syllables. Guruji gave me this instruction. But then the blessings are like the heat of a fire. Yeah, it's like the logic has the question, but the experience has the answer. Yeah, that's you know, an interesting you, way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> if you try to find the answer in the logic, I think we could be saying the same thing over and over again and yet not come to an answer which would be convincing the logic to accept it. Yeah, I think the experiential part of it is uh, very interesting. And uh, I would love to, uh, uh, you know, try the mantra. I have uh, recited Om Mani Padme Ham yeah. uh, quite a few times. Yes, I have been to a few ministries, Ladakh Hemis ministry that oh, you talked about. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. I have been to multiple across uh, Himachal, across Ladakh, wow. across uh, uh, some other parts in the country also. Hemis monastery in Ladakh is one place where you feel... Um, I mean, all the monasteries have their own Divine energy. Yeah, there blessings. is definitely something there. Uh, you just don't feel like coming out of uh, yeah, it the It's just a blissful place. It's Even the, uh, the one in Dharamshala. Yes. Uh, my God, the vibrations are <laughs> so strong. You yes. can feel them. You just want to be there and you don't. So I, I connect very strongly to, to Buddhism mm. because I, I love the concepts that you have. Again, I might not know a lot about yes. the teachings and the four noble truths and yes. the basic information I would know because I've studied the subject a bit. Yes. But the foundation is the same. It's, it's about faith. It's about compassion. It's, it's about, about love. love. It's yes. about kindness. Yes. And all of those teachings are just so, so relevant in the times like today when we see that all of this is getting eroded yes. from our hearts from our minds from the fabric of our society that's a very, very, very good way to put it I think you notice the erosion uh, of these values you notice that um, coming from a very ancient society as Indians we our default emotions were that of love and compassion mm -hmm. giving if you look at all the uh, epics, if you look at the history of India, it is so mm. forgiving, it is so full of compassion and mm. spirituality. Mm. But now, unfortunately, people are becoming very materialistic, everything is mm. getting very congested, everything is getting becoming very cutthroat. Mm. And I think spirituality and religion has become like a tool to become richer, mm. to gain more influence. It mm. is, politicians use it as a tool, businessmen use it as, I don't know, uh, you know, an avenue uh, you know, you puja karlo, do this puja for me, please. Mm. Uh, my business is stuck. They change mm. their names, you know, like mm. so many things. So I think uh, our default emotions have changed mm. to that of ego, mm. uh, you know, ignorance, anger, mm. desire, attachment, you know, uh, jealousy, greed. Mm. So we, had, we need to replace our default mm. emotions. Your default emotions, mm. the one that you wake up, the when, mm. one that is... Uh, that is always with you should be mm. that of compassion, love, yeah, wisdom, mm. prajna. And it should be that of forgiveness, patience, you know, mm. acceptance, very important. It is almost ironical that our nature, true nature, uh, which is of all this that you spoke about, uh, we have started to believe that our true nature is of competitiveness, yes. it's of jealousy, because that's become the automatic response and behavior. Because so we feel me, yeah. that's that's the true thing and we have to learn our actual yeah. own true nature, which is of compassion, kindness and yeah, nobility. In, in Buddhism, we call it uh, the Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha. Yeah? Mm. So it's basically like a diamond, but um, we don't realize that it's been wrapped in a dirty rag. Mm. But it's like a clean window. Mm. It is soiled uh, through eons, you know, through generations and generations, mm. many births mm. of getting caught up in competition and ego and jealousy and all these bad habits. Mm. So I think the practice of Buddhism is the gentle cleansing mm. and unwrapping, unraveling mm. of this rag and to discover that at our core, as human beings, we're not rotten. We're not bad. We actually have good qualities. Mm. Not only us, but all beings. But these beings, I think like a mosquito or an elephant mm. uh, or a dog, it's much more difficult to teach them, mm. understand? Because they don't have the same uh, capabilities as we humans do mm. to understand certain things. Though they have their own fantastic qualities, mm. uh, they don't have this, uh, you know, the necessary components mm. that are needed to fully realize it. Mm. On, only humans can do it. Mm. So we have a very big responsibility. If we can... Uh, uh, apply empathy in our life, um, everything gets so much more easier because the more ripples that you don't cause, uh, it's coming back to you, right? Exactly. So if you don't cause you more, put it so well. it's it's beautiful. Very true. Mm. It comes back in the form of a tsunami. <laughs> and then you blame the tsunami, you know, you're the one who caused the ripple. Yeah, you are the ones who fluttered the wings and mm. then it comes into the form of a tornado. 
Mm. Yeah, that's how karma basically works. I want to live in this world which is beautiful, which has nice things, you and I want that. to experience yeah, that. There's no harm in that. Yeah. Really, there's no harm in that. Mm. And you do a very good job at that. You know, you connect to so many people. The gift that you have of your speech, your blessed speech. Yeah. And I've listened to you many times. I've met you a few times. Mm. And the gift that you have of presenting yourself to the people with your grace, with your beauty, and especially with your speech, uh, you're blessed with a golden tongue. And I really hope that in seminars, in big events, not only that, but also through this podcast, through YouTube and all that, you'll be able to connect to many people. Thank you so much, yeah. Guruji, uh, for saying all those things. I don't know how much of uh, it I really deserve. Uh, for me, anchoring as a profession just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think some of the best things in life to us just happen and we should have the courage to embrace them. More often than not, we don't have the courage to go through with them, you know. Yes. We leave them. So I think to, and same goes for faith. Uh, I think we all have faith in us, but to have the courage to practice that faith in that moment, do we have that or not is the real true, question. True. Very yeah. True. So these are some of the questions and I'm at an intersection or crossroads in my life where I'm trying to, you know, have my way with all these concepts and try to figure it out that how they are practically applicable in my life today. How can I still lead a life that I want to live uh, without uh, renouncing anything or without harming anybody, but yet practicing these concepts which connect me to my deeper purpose, to a deeper meaning to life, um, to create some goodness if I can. I don't know how much I can to create that, that in life. So uh, that is the reason that I wanted to bring in your blessings on this podcast, your wisdom on this podcast. Uh, uh, I would want to ask you a couple of more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Guruji, how can the principles of uh, Buddhism help me with anxiety? I really cannot tell you when I started to lose my anxiety, my depression. I used to have depression issues, you know, um, and also anger issues. I was a very angry child because getting locked up and beaten and past PTSD from past life, PTSD, PTSD from this life. From you know this I mean? life. Yeah, I'm like, Jita Jagta PTSD. <laughs> so... <laughs> I really cannot tell you when it happened, what happened, what clicked, what didn't click. All I know is that years of chanting, years of accumulating, uh, chanting mm -hmm. mantras, studying Buddhist texts, listening to my gurus, mm -hmm. different gurus. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I would say maybe thinking from not only my head, from my brain, but also thinking mm -hmm. from my heart, using my heart more than my brain, not mm -hmm. judging people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just embracing people, mm -hmm. embracing um different experiences even if it's um a bad experience because if you only negate the good uh the bad emotions and the bad experience and you only take the good ones mm. you're cutting it 50 percent mm. i think yeah? more because more learning happens with, with, bad, with bad, bad experiences exactly. so let's just say 50 50 mm. but you're cutting it half but if you also embrace and you analyze and mm. you don't reject mm. and you don't judge even bad emotions Mm. You know, like how you don't judge bad people mm. or bad experience. You also don't judge bad emotions and all that. You see them for what they are. You not only accept them, mm. but you to transform them. Like mm. anger is like, you ang anger can be destructive if expressed, but anger can also be channeled with the correct understanding to burn your bad karma. I also do f get the feeling of anger, mm. but I don't express it. But with the power of mantras, the power of supplication, uh, the power of faith in my guru mm -hmm. and in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, I, I feel that it's burning my mm -hmm. bad mm -hmm. karmas because I'm not mm -hmm. expressing it. Mm -hmm. I'm being patient. Yeah, mm -hmm. And being patient doesn't mean that you suppress your anger. Mm -hmm. It means you accept your anger. You understand mm -hmm. that there's anger happening in your mind. Yeah, you've explained it really beautifully. Um, anger, you know, like you said, can be very destructive, but it can also be channelized into very, very yes. constructive ways. Yes. Because if you feel a deep sense of anger, if you're like, I'm this person, that means you have that sense of capacity to feel passion towards something so yes. deep. Yes. Right. True, true, true. If you cannot feel things so passionately or deeply, you can't have that anger. Very true. That only comes out. When, so when yeah. you have that capacity, it's a very human capacity. Yes. Now, if you want to drive that human capacity in a negative way, it's your choice. But yes. you can also drive it to cause Something a positive. big change. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause that impact because you have that in you. And to it can lead manifest that impact. in terms of wealth, <clears throat> in terms of good friends. Sorry. 
in terms of success prosperity spiritual advancement in terms of adding everything. goodness for others in the world yeah if you are angry about a particular way a system works and you're channelizing it in a way that it's not serving you or not helping to change the system it's going nowhere right yes. it's the wastage yes. of energy yes. but if you're channelizing that anger and that passion and that disliking that you have you to focus it on something zero it focus, on something yeah, of yeah. course yeah. and you zero it down mm -hmm. onto a path which is somewhere trying to make shifts even if those are little it's constructive guru ji what is your definition of spirituality a very simple basic definition that we can understand and then uh, apply okay in my opinion spirituality doesn't have to be religious doesn't have to be ritualistic uh in my opinion spirituality is about humanity it's about love and compassion very simple mm. it's about being a good person mm. it's about spreading joy mm. living a meaningful life mm. short time that we are on this earth mm. what with covid and accidents and cancer and you know well, lightning bolts and god knows what will happen tomorrow mm. <laughs> alien invasion perhaps <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's about making somebody happy mm. it's about being kind to someone Mm. Yeah, even if you can't hug someone, mm. you just smile to that person. Mm. Yes, your smile becomes an offering. Mm. It becomes a form of generosity. A poor person asks Buddha, "I don't have any money to offer. So how can I practice generosity?" Buddha said, "No problem. You have a smile, right? Mm. Your smile is generosity also." Yes, and I think that is one of the most simplest but most beautiful act of kindness that you can do. Also, jata jata, I want to ask you one last question uh, that I ask all my guests. Um, in the world that we live in today, there's so much of information, so there is a lot of confusion. Yes. So, what is your definition of success? Ah, oh, that's difficult. Contentment. Mm. How content you are. That's it. Mm. Really. whether it's money clothes friends or whether it's spiritual mm. inside or outside both mm. contentment i think that's one uh, kind of like a you know measurement you can put uh, guru ji how do we become more content uh, because we are so outwardly drawn that we are chasing the next thing right at the time we are receiving one how do we become more content in my opinion by prioritizing the right things so i prioritize the quality of my time i prioritize um you know my spiritual attainment my inner happiness mm. so i will not sacrifice it for anything else mm -hmm. yeah so then i don't know, it's very difficult to explain it mm. but i think to be content it's also to, to be aware that chasing the next thing is you're repeating the same cycle we live mm. in big and small cycles so this cycle of shopping and discarding shopping and discarding attending parties and going through what do you call it hangovers <laughs> <laughs> it's is like cycles everywhere mm. i mean aren't you tired you know like for god's sake like for how many cycles will you keep repeating we already exist in this big cycle of mm. life and death and mm. we have so many cycles mm. yeah so i don't know at some point i really point, like uh, the way you put it that you know prioritizing uh, what contentment means for yeah. you mean uh, to you i think that is one uh, big learning from me here Uh, because that prioritizing can only happen when you have the clarity yes and to have that clarity you really have to be very reflective and build this awareness about what really is it that you See, want the power of speech <laughs> <laughs> you put in much better words than i did <laughs> no 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 guru ji you you're just being humble no. but thank you so much for joining me on the journey within podcast and talking i do have to give you a small gift before you finish ha huh. me i yes yes thank please you. thank you thank you so much okay Thank you. So basically, this is a very traditional scarf, and it comes in two many different colors. But um, the color that we use, you, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Come on. The color that we use as a form of um, respect mm. and more endearment is mm. the yellow color, mm. and it has the eight auspicious symbols mm. uh, to bring prosperity, longevity, uh, success in your life, and also. it has the mantras and um, written here and yes, some shlokas like nimo delek chen delek nimo going delek shing min sen tado delek pa kum cho sum kita shisho may you be blessed by the buddha dharma and sangha uh, may your day be uh, auspicious nimo delek and may your night be auspicious yeah it's so beautiful guru ji thank you so much all the time prosperity yeah. and auspicious thank you so much for yeah. blessing me with this really really means a and lot and this is om mani padme hum and with the extra syllable of shri this is om mani padme hum yeah mm. so basically it's a sanskrit 
Sanskrit shlok, Sanskrit mm. mantra, but written in Bodhi. Mm. So Aum is A O Ma, it's mm-hmm. body, speech, and mind. Yeah, and Ma Ni Padmiho. Money is uh, money is money, uh, like money, you know, uh, like mm-hmm. jewel. Jewel, right. yeah, Sanskrit. Padme, Padma is a flower, lotus flower. Lotus Padme flower. means inside the lotus. Padme, mm-hmm. who means like pranam. So basically, with my body, speech, and mind, I pay homage. To the jewel wrapped up in the lotus. Mm. It's basically and the talking about. Up. So basically, uh, the money, the jewel represents tab, which is compassion, and padma represents uh, wisdom, mm. enlightenment. Yeah. So it is a combination of wisdom and compassion, a union of wisdom and compassion. And Thank she you so is, much. It, it encapsulates the entire mantra. But the actual mantra is Om Mani Padme Hum, the six syllables. Thank you, you so much, Guruji. You I will, I will, I will <laughs> hang it in my house. It's it's yeah, very it's very, uh, uh, you know, it's such a meaningful gift to give, Guruji. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I will uh, keep it very very safely and I'll hang it in my home. Thank you so much for coming to the journey within podcast with me and uh, helping us understand this inner world so much more. We talk about so many things that uh, can bring peace, joy. Uh, and happiness to my inner world and if this inner world is sorted i believe that our outer world will start to look more better than how they look and feel right now very true thank you so much once thank again so guruji much. yeah thank you